It is now my pleasure to introduce someone that I take orders from, I get late night phone calls, I get berated when I fall asleep and don't get on the conference call, and uh, I'm mighty proud those few times when he says, you did the job well, because he always has those helpful hints that makes me a better person. And if I could say anything about this brother, I could say all his life, from when he was a young man and decided that he was going to lead youth and get them in a drill team and get them in a, a leadership and community civic action kind of program, that Ron Daniels has been contributing to his community. Absolutely. He has been where we needed him. I first met him back in, woo, 1972, I think it was. <laughs> that's been a little while. And that's at the National Black Political Convention and later with the National Black Political Assembly. And he's had me hooked ever since. He's a, a, a professor, lecturer at the uh, uh, City College of New York. He's a columnist. He's the visionary behind the Institute of the Black World. He has, I would say, taken point. Now he has a team around him. But he was the one that had the vision to say, we need to pay attention to Haiti, that Haiti was very special to African Americans and Africans in the diaspora. And he has put the Haiti Support Project on the map as the foremost African American uh, organization working in support of Haiti. Ron is tireless. He's a little older than me. I don't know how he keeps it, but I try to keep up. With no further ado, Brother Ron Daniels, President, Founder of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. Thank you very much, Rick. Don't make me too old now, because uh, I said a little. All right, because I ain't no ways tired. All right. I have an opportunity to say a few words later. I just wanted to, as a point of personal privilege, be able to introduce these next two speakers. <clears throat> First of all, I wanted to acknowledge. I think I saw the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance ease into the room. Uh, Ethan Nettleman. Is he? Did he? Did I see him coming to the room? Would you stand for acknowledgement, please? Uh, he, they're helping to coordinate uh, projects all across the country today. Did he? All right. We now like to bring to the podium for remarks on this occasion, because it is a serious occasion. Forty years since the declaration of the war on drugs, and in the hood, folks have a way of just sort of making it plain. It didn't take long before the brothers and sisters began to say the war on drugs is a war on us. And it has been a war on us. It's tragic that race still matters in American society, despite the fact that we have a black family in the White House and there's some illusion about a post-racial America, which I hope one day occurs. But the fact of the matter is race still matters structurally. And nothing demonstrates that more than the war on drugs. And a person who has been a champion on issues of police accountability, of the, the prison jail industrial complex, trying to end these disparities between crack and powder cocaine. I mean, consistently, he's been on this struggle for many, many years. And he is one of the most distinguished leaders we have in America today. He hails from the great city of Detroit. Uh, we know him. We love him. He's been a fierce fighter for all of his life. Would you please? Welcome. He's still my chairman, but he's the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee, the Honorable John Conyers, Jr. Thank you, Ron. Just like I wrote it. You're, you're good, man. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, this is a momentous occasion, and uh, to be here with the Institute of the Black World and all of you uh, is an honor for me. And in a sense, I represent everybody in the Congressional Black Caucus, all 42 other members, particularly including Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., and Bobby Scott, the congressman from Virginia. Give them a round of applause and all of our members. Uh, this is a, an old subject for us. It's not new. 
We've been fighting this whole thing in the name of making uh, the justice system better. And we have some problems that have developed. Namely, uh, the rate of incarceration uh, has grown even as the crime rate has gone down. This is, on one part of the paper, you're reading that the crime rate's down, but when you look at the facts with Rainbow Push or the NAACP or the Congressional Black Caucus or the Institute of the Black World, the rate of incarceration is going up at the same time. Uh, the reason that I suggest is that uh, people are being rearrested and, and incarcerated uh, on technical violations, violations of parole or probation, uh, and the whole drug question uh, is something that I'm going to say something here today that I, I've never said before. I think we ought to decriminalize marijuana as a, uh, as a criminal activity. Uh, well, why? Why do you want to do that, Chairman? Because uh, the use is so widespread. As a matter of fact, it's going up. Uh, it's commonplace. Uh, and uh, the, the medicinal harm has not been established, and nor have we connected it necessarily to the use of other addictive drugs. Uh, and so I, I say that as we meet here today in Washington and 700,000 people are coming out of our prisons, federal and state, every single year, 700,000. Now, in the states that bar a, a felon from ever voting for the rest of his life, uh, that's something that Reverend Dr. Jesse Lewis Jackson is going to comment on. That means that our voting power is decreased because of the disproportionate number of African Americans that are incarcerated, sometimes rightly and sometimes wrongly, in the first place. And by the way, uh, let us give a round of applause to the man that worked with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and has gone on and continued his legacy more accurately and closely than any of the people that surrounded Dr. King, Reverend Dr. Jesse Lewis Jackson. Now, I don't know if, uh, if uh, our distinguished uh, leader, Dr. Ron Daniels, arranged this with the New York Times, but ex-president Jimmy Carter published on the editorial page uh, uh, a, a uh, column entitled, Call Off the Global Drug War. And uh, how many people have seen this in today's paper? Quite a few. And it's very instructive because more and more people are realizing that our incarceration of our own citizens uh, exceeds that the, the rate of more than uh, any other country on earth. We all know that. Uh, I think it's accurate to say that there, there are more uh, black young men in prison than are, there are in college. It's true for over 20 years. And it's been true for over 20 years, I've been advised. And so 
Uh, we have a very serious problem. Uh, and this is what we're here to talk about today. One of the things I want to do is connect up all of the organizations that have been seriously working on this problem, starting with uh, the institute that brings us here today. But Rainbow Push starts its conference in Chicago tomorrow. I'm going there. Can I get uh, about 20% of you to go there with me to Chicago? Here's a, going to Chicago. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, uh, you can go to uh, Delta Airlines, uh, American, and tell them I sent you. Uh, in addition, if you don't care to fly, you can also go to the uh, train station in Washington and, and tell them the same thing there. And I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Chicago, because I will be there. And I wish you good luck, too, brother. <laughs> now, in addition to Rainbow Push and the Institute for the Black World is the Congressional Black Caucus. On September the 21st at the uh, Washington Convention Center, we have our 40th, God, Dr. Elsie Scott, the the head of the, found, the foundation walked in, give her a round of applause. The, the executive director of the foundation is here. Uh, what, what we're doing uh, during those five days from September 21st is that we're having workshops. And I have a whole day, uh, I think it's Friday, and that we will be doing a workshop on this criminal justice system that is not just. We, we got to deal with that. And we've also begin, I've got to begin to organize those people that are coming out of prison. Do you mind if I say something about you, my brother? Uh, here's a brother that's been looking for a job for how long? about a year. He had been working for how long? And they came to him, one, three years, they came to him one day and said, oh, by the way, we found out that you had one time been incarcerated. And you know what that means? We got to let you go. It wasn't, a, there wasn't anything about coming to work on time or the quality of his work or the way he comported himself. They, somebody looked up and found out he had a record, and he has been out of work ever since. There, there are many others that don't ever get to, to, uh, to get fired for be having a record. And so what we've got to do here with all these organizations, I haven't mentioned the NACP and the Urban League uh, and uh, a number of other organizations, and there are a lot of local organizations. We've got to do what uh, Reverend Dr. Charles Adams at Hartford Avenue Baptist Church in Detroit has done. They have a committee in the church working with people that have been formerly incarcerated, and they meet and they're organizing. Do you know what, how much strength we would add to the struggle for justice. Uh-oh, the hook is coming. <laughs> Do you, well, he always starts off nice, but he has been known to get physical when, we, when we're dealing with who controls the microphone. But do you know uh, how much power in conclusion that we have uh, if we were to organize everybody that's been sent to prison and, and recognize and encourage them and help them get jobs and help the Congressional Black Caucus change some of these draconian laws 
at the federal and state level. 